Attention, brothers and sisters. Take a look around. We are killing the future. Killing the future. Killing the future. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon, and we are recording this on June 16th of 2014, and I'll tell you what, Ramon, it's been, uh, actually today was one of those interesting weather days here in western Washington, uh, it was kind of overcast, all, overcast most of the morning, and then when it started to break up, it's uh, and it's still that way, uh, the clouds are kind of, I don't know, kind of clumpy. Uh, it's hard to explain. They just don't. Uh, I don't know. They don't look right. Again. Yeah. I mean, uh, we had those uh, three or four days last week. I think it was. Yeah, a week ago, where we had just absolutely crystal clear skies here, and it was uh, it was Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, uh, and I think that had they must have got a three day weekend or something because. Uh, um, it was beautiful. It was absolutely gorgeous here, and I haven't seen weather like that here for quite a while. So, so uh, how's things going over there in Japan? Uh, pretty good. Uh, Sunday, um, me and my wife, we went out shopping, and, you know, uh, my wife now, I guess because I, I've exposed her to so much of the stuff that she can look up now and say, oh, look at that shit, uh, you know, right. in the air now. And um, one of the things I want to throw out there from the beginning is, I, I'm wondering if that does an effect to the sunlight, meaning that, I don't know, when, when they spray that crap up in the air, it feels like the sun kind of burns a little extra than when mm-hmm. the sky's clear. I don't know. Well, we'll we'll definitely uh, uh, yeah. We'll have to ask that. Hold that, that point, over. Ramon. Hold that point because you are exactly right, and I'll elaborate that on that whenever you guys wish. Oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and uh, get you in here, Dane. We have Dane Wigington with us. He has an extensive background in solar energy. He's a former employee of Bechtel Power Corporation, and was a licensed contractor in California and Arizona. His personal residence was featured in a cover article in the world's largest renewable energy magazine. Home Power. He owns a 1,600-acre wildlife preserve next to Lake Shasta in Northern California. Dane focuses his energy, his efforts and energy on the geoengineering issue when he began to lose a very significant amount of solar uptake due to ever-increasing solar obscuration uh, caused from the aircraft spraying, as he also noted, significant decline in forest health and began testing and research into the geoengineering issue about a decade ago. Uh, He's the lead researcher for www.geoengineeringwatch.org and has investigated all levels of geoengineering from chemtrails to HARP. Uh, He assisted Michael Murphy with his production of What in the World Are They Spraying and has appeared on a a ton of different shows uh, doing interviews and talking about geoengineering and what the hell is really going on welcome to the hundredth monkey radio dane wigington thank you tom thank you ramon thanks for the courage to address this issue and if we could get this one out in the open it would cause a shockwave around the globe this is the elephant in the room that the power structure is trying the most desperately to hide oh man you know this is something that i i just absolutely find it amazing that people don't see it I mean, I, I'm I'm pointing it out to people constantly. I have been for years now, and and they just they look at it, and I get the deer in the headlights look. You know, they're like, uh, what, huh? And 
Uh, you know, and and that really says something about uh, how well organized the programming has been throughout the years. You know, people are truly conditioned, and this this doesn't fit into their reality. The notion that they can have so little control over their world that they can be sprayed like lab rats uh, without any means of stopping it is is just too overwhelming for a lot of people, and they fight tenaciously. Anybody who's tried to share this message sees how um, aggressively people try to deny it right. without any knowledge of fact uh, right. or, or any basis in truth. Well, one of the first arguments I always get from people is, oh, that's just a contrail. And well, would you would you explain uh, the difference between, uh, explain to us what a contrail is and the difference between a contrail and what is being called a chemtrail? And even the different clouds, too. Yeah, you know, a a few factors on there. Good point, Ramon. First, almost every trail we see in the sky, even the short, bright trails, are sprayed disbursements. They're not condensation, with few exceptions. Now, a a high-bypass turbofan jet engine, that is the engine on all commercial aircraft, on all military tankers. There's about a 20-minute animated tutorial on the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org that can explain this this engine and it's designed to people because 80% of the air that passes through that engine is non-combusted. This engine by design is not capable of producing a condensation trail except under the most extreme conditions. And we have film footage of aircraft leaving the short, bright trails turning on and off. You can't turn a condensation trail on and off. And also... If people stop to consider when their breath condenses on a cold day as they're hooping down the street, you don't turn around, look behind you, and see a trail hanging in the air for a mile behind you. You know, it's <laughs> the bottom line is, you know, this, th- these trails are spray disbursements. And even on the days like Ramon described, and it's, it shows that he has obviously a keen sense of observation because most people, you know, the, as conditioned as they are, wouldn't notice that their head caught fire. But uh, Ramon's exactly right. On certain days, under certain applications of the spraying, where you typically will see it's under a high-pressure zone generally, where you'll see the short, bright trails, but the air becomes more and more silvery white as the day goes on, as the spraying goes on, and the sun actually feels more intense, not less. And we know from UV metering that, in fact, the UV radiation goes up on those days, not down. So that type of application appears to create a lens effect, which makes it even hotter on the ground. Why would they do this? Well, in the case of over the the U.S. West, they continuously build these high-pressure zones over us, and we continuously see the type of application I just described. High-pressure days, extremely low humidity, this these shorter bright trails, but the air becomes very silvery white. You have many times these cobweb clouds that, like Ramon perhaps mentioned, you know, these are not natural clouds, they're aerosol clouds, and we see that lens effect occur. And as that builds the heat, it would build the strength of the high-pressure zone, which uh, further increases the clockwise rotation of that high-pressure zone in the northern hemisphere, and that further enhances their ability to steer the jet stream. So it's it's probably related to uh, whatever type of engineering they're doing somewhere else in the country, in, in the case of the U.S. West. So we see that kind of application as well. But in regard to the, these uh, shorter bright trails, also sprayed disbursements. And we know this, again, one more uh, film footage bit of, of evidence. We have footage of some of these planes leaving these shorter bright trails that one one side, one plume on the trail of a four-jet aircraft goes far out to the side and comes back in. We have a number of film segments of this. So... Either that's not a condensation trail, or if it is, there's a jet engine mounted crooked on the plane, Hmm, which I don't think is the case. So obviously it's a nozzle that's misaligned. And we have, bottom line with with the spraying period, we have film footage up close and personal of these tankers at altitude spraying, turning on and off, nozzles visible, end of argument. They're spraying, period. Yeah. Here's a, um, I'm going to mention two different other types of, Clouds Before we go there, I, I want to uh, clarify the, the contrail thing here real quick. What are the conditions? I heard it was like a the, the rare conditions that a contrail can form. I heard it was like 
there's like only a four degree temperature degree uh, span that they can form in? Well, let me tell you what NASA, or excuse me, NOAA's original criteria for conditions necessary to form a naturally occurring vapor trail. 70 below, 70% humidity. You almost never have that. The higher you go, the colder it gets, the less humidity you have. Now, they've changed that data. Just like they changed the quote-unquote safe limit for radiation after Fukushima blew uh, to astronomically high levels, as if there's any safe level of radiation, uh, when, when the conditions on the ground are cataclysmic, they just change the quote-unquote science to make it seem less cataclysmic. Same thing with the vapor trails. Now you see some NOAA data that says, well, maybe it's 40 below, maybe it's 30 below. They sort of make this stuff up as they go. But the original NOAA criteria was 70 below, 70% humidity. Almost never have that. And um, if you saw a, an actual condensation trail, it would be almost transparent. The plane would have to be at extremely high altitude. It would be in the coldest times of the year with moisture in the air. There would be a gap between the plane and the condensation, slight gap as the air cools before it goes into uh, the actual uh, uh, condensation and nucleation of these ice crystals, and it would be very short, perhaps 30 seconds max. That's it. So everything else we see is sprayed particulates. And again, we have so much film footage, there's absolutely no denying in both cases, whether horizon to horizon trail or the shorter, bright uh, trails that uh, come in different colors, by the way, different hues. We have a number of film footage segments that show very different uh, spectrometry from these trails. They're clearly different substances. So, again, the, the mountain of data is there, absolutely there to, to confirm we are not seeing condensation trails. And not to mention the east-west, or like an over our area, we have flight pattern or grid patterns that involve trajectories that there's no commercial flights. We have FAA uh, flight path records uh, with GPS tracking showing giant loops being made up and down the states. Uh, I mean, there's so much evidence to corroborate these programs being fully deployed. It's ridiculous. Right. All right. Yeah. Well, go for it. <laughs> Sorry for cutting you out there, bud. Um, the with the different. Oh, by the way, I, I'm in Japan, so it, it's yeah, not different that. at all. But um, the there's two two different. Um, I'll mention one type of cloud that I'm actually really surprised the average person here is talking about. And that is the, it looks like, um, the best way I can describe it, it looks like a wave. It's, it's a weird cloud. It looks like a wave and usually happens right before an earthquake. You're talking about the washer board type. Yeah, exactly. And I'm wondering, are that, is that natural due to some kind of magnetic something that, uh, the earthquake might cause? Because now everybody looks, at that, so if they see those kind of clouds, they're like, okay, this is going to be an earthquake. Well, in the case of the, the Fukushima quake, we have more than enough data, some from very recognized science institutions that indicate that quake was indeed triggered by radio frequency mechanism, i.e. The, the HARP ionosphere heaters. Uh, even, I'll try to pull this up on the net while I'm speaking so I can read an actual headline to you, but there was extremely anomalous atmospheric heating prior to the triggering of the Fukushima quake, and that was directly over the epicenter. You have the science community trying to find some sort of reason that the pressure from the, the epicenter would cause that atmospheric heating, but they have, they're trying to put the cart before the horse. It's the atmospheric heating with that signal bouncing down into that seismically sensitive area that caused the quake, not the other way around. So when you have organizations, again, like MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and other very well-known scientific agencies acknowledging this atmospheric heating just prior to that quake, it's pretty hard to ignore. And when we see RF frequency all over the sky, all the time, you see these perfectly aligned clouds, these ribs, and what's the use of the RF frequencies? When they're spraying these particulates, depending on their polarization and depending on the frequency they're exposed to, they can cause the particulates to scatter across the sky, to repel each other, to fan out in as wide an area as possible, or depending on the polarization and the frequency, they can cause these 
nanoparticulates to come together, which forms a large enough condensation nuclei to trigger precipitation. So what this means in regard to rainfall is over the Pacific Northwest, they've, or over California in, in particular, they've migrated the moisture over us again and again and again. They are literally droughting us into a dust bowl here. And so as they scatter those particulates, they fan them out and put too many condensation nuclei in the air, the rain doesn't fall. It migrates. This is science fact. As, the, as this moisture gets further eastward, they can bring these particulates together and then cause precipitation where they choose. So uh, the, the source of clouds you see, Ramon, that have the RF frequency, yes, uh, these, these transmitters are all over the globe. In fact, they just set another one up in Japan, SBX, uh, sea-based X-band radar looks like a giant golf ball on, on an oil derrick. Have you guys seen any images of that? I have, yeah. Uh, where is it? Do you know where in Japan? It's in, God, I want to say that it's in either either Yokohama. It might even be in Kyoto. It's in it's it's near one of the bigger cities near the coast, and I, I can't remember. Is it near city. one of the military base? This particular installation, I believe, had about 100 personnel on it. There was protests from some of the Japanese citizens about this. And, and you have other countries as well that are protesting these installations being set up. In fact, did you guys hear about the cataclysmic flooding in Serbia and Bosnia? Right, right, yeah. Okay, they got, they got slaughtered, and they've just had some of these ionosphere heaters set up there. And um, they're being set up around the globe. We don't know how many there are. Truthfully, we think there's well over two dozen large ground-based facilities. You guys may have heard some rumors since for the second time in as many years, in two years, that CARP, HARP was going to be dismantled. Right. Did you guys hear any? Right. Yeah. And, and yet again, as, as we predicted, that was rumor. And HARP is now uh, being extended again, funded again. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all designed to create confusion. And if they did take HARP down, it would only be because they have more sophisticated and less visible installations around okay. the globe. So uh, the degree to which the atmosphere is being manipulated with the aerial civilization, which makes it more conductive, all these metallic particles being dispersed, and the R frequency, the degree to which our entire life support weather system is being manipulated is, is beyond comprehension. It's, there is no natural weather. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the other kind of cloud I want to talk about, um, I, I'm trying to remember the exact name, convex. It's uh, when the clouds go really high up and the water inside of them freezes and it turns like into an ice sheet and it falls down and melts. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure which term you're referring to in the upper atmosphere. I mean, we're seeing a lot of noctilucent clouds right now. They're showing up all over the globe as a result of of methane saturation in the atmosphere, seeing a lot of undulatus apparatus clouds. Have you guys seen the picture of the clouds that look like you're looking up at the surface of the ocean? Right, right. right. Okay, and those, for example, on those that type of cloud, again, it's, it's pronounced undulatus apparatus. That's a formation that was only named in 2008. So one has to ask, did it exist before? Could something that profound have been missed? I don't think so. So we're seeing new phenomenon in the atmosphere everywhere because the climate engineering is completely dismantling Earth's natural systems. So the atmosphere is stratifying. It's layering. It's not mixing properly. And how can it mix when you canopy everything with this reflective layer of toxic metal particulates? That changes convection. It changes wind flow. It changes everything. So you have the, at the atmosphere stratifying, and that's one of the reasons you see that type of cloud, and we're seeing other phenomenon as well. Has there been any uh, official smoke and mirror story that came out that tried to explain why we are having new clouds now? No. You know, it's this is astounding, as you mentioned earlier, Tom, that people don't notice the sky above their head. So they certainly don't notice when all these new terms are being thrown at them, when they have Weather Channel spending five minutes at a time trying to explain why it's snowing at 45 degrees and 50 degrees, how there can be winter storms in the right. U.S. that come out of the Gulf of Mexico every week on cue, uh, why there's an ice storm in the transition zone between the, quote, warm side of the winter storm and the cold side of the winter storm. Since when does a winter storm have a warm side with tornadoes and thundershowers? 
And why would there always be an ice storm transition zone between the two? Because that's the zone where the moisture is being chemically nucleated to create artificial ice nucleation. And so in that transition zone, when it's cooling down, you have a lot of this material hitting the ground before it freezes, before it sets up. So you have an ice storm now, always, between these, this chain of theaterized winter storms that we had all winter long in the U.S. Um, so now people don't seem to be noticing, to answer your question, they, they, they just seem to accept whatever they're fed, and, and, and they gulp it down, you know, hook, line, and sinker. But with what's unfolding now, I would argue people's heads are going to be ripped out of the sand very, very soon uh, because the walls are truly closing in from a lot of directions. Yeah, yeah. You know, this year, it seems to be, uh, just this year, it seemed that the the whole Chemtail program has uh, stepped it up a notch. I mean, I, I, I've i seen more this year than I've seen, you know, I've been paying attention for a few years now, uh, paying close attention for a few years now, and this year, they just really seem to ramp things up. Yeah, you're right, Tom, because here in Japan, they... You know, when I first started learning about chemtrails back in 2009, and I got here in 2010, it wasn't nowhere near as it is now. Right. And it's funny because I, I was saying a, a couple shows before, I've even seen it in movies where the chemtrail shows up, you know, in the background of a movie. Yeah, I think I've seen them drawn in cartoons now. Uh, they are. They are. That's part of the conditioning now. And there is... Uh, but here's something that's been a little confusing for a lot of people in the anti-geoengineering movement. There, there's films going back to the 60s where there is sprayed trails, there is you know, geoengineering particulate trails in the background scenes going back to the 60s. Now, and, and this is, the, we, we know the programs existed going back to the late 40s. They were very small in scale during those early decades. So, why are they in some of these big box office Hollywood films going back that far? They certainly planned on ramping these programs up over many decades and carrying them on forever. If you look at the early early data surrounding the expansion of these programs, uh, that was clearly part of the motive. So did they make it a point, perhaps, to be in the background above some of these films so that they would have some sort of a record that, and try to play this off as being just normal traffic. It's hard to say, but certainly they're there, and, we, and certainly we know these programs existed then, so it's not really a surprise to see them there. On the kids' animated films, yes. In fact, there's a, a YouTube that has uh, several dozen kids' films highlighted. There's uh, Over the Hedge, Cars, uh, a lot of these animated films, and the trails are everywhere, everywhere in these kids' films. It's conditioning. It, it shows the, the sort of insidious nature of the people that are behind these programs. It's astounding. And have you guys seen, and Ramon, I, I would certainly like to connect with you or you know, have a contact with you after the show to, to have some sort of observation in Japan. I would be very grateful for that. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, but the, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys had seen NASA actually put out a, a program to teach kids that these trails they see in the sky are completely harmful, harmless, and natural. And, you know, when people like NASA engage in this, um, it's, it's a crime. It can't be described as anything else. To teach a child that what they're inhaling, giving them asthma, autism, all sorts of breathing disorders, is harmless. I, I don't have the words for what kind of person would engage in such a program, but they do. So what we're trying to do at geoengineeringwatch.org we have a site now called Disinformation Directory, all one word, disinformationdirectory.com. And our purpose for that site is to expose people, individuals with NASA, in this case, who are willing to devote their time and professional energy toward such an incredi incredibly criminal behavior. So we're trying to expose them, put the light on them, uh, put their identity out to the larger public, their, their public email contact, and let the public start asking them why they're behaving in this manner. We want to let them know we know who they are. So, so Dane, in your, in your bio, you men mentioned that uh, you started noting this through uh, the, the decrease in sunlight that you were getting out of your solar panels. Uh, would, would you kind of briefly explain that process that you went through 
of realization of what was going on? Yeah, it's a pretty hard realization. I mean, you can certainly understand why people, when you introduce them to the subject, and this was my background. I mean, looking at the sky has always been a part of my life. Um, and I, as you mentioned, I don't know if you, did you guys lose audio? No, we're still here. No, we're still here. Are you hearing a lot of noises on the phone? Uh, I okay. sure am. On, on this uh, one, yeah. I'm not. I, I definitely heard you uh, cut out for a second there. Yeah, my voice kind of comes back. I mean, that's the sort of thing I, I get every single show now. But uh, so when I moved to Pacific Welcome Northwest, to the show, the other people listening. <laughs> yeah, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do hope that there's, there's people listening in because we're trying to save the, their lives, the lives of their children as well. If these programs continue, we all go down. Um, I grew up in smog. Southern California was always perplexed at uh, I mean, the smog was so bad, you, we didn't have recess. They would cancel baseball games, and I was always perplexed at how the adults could ignore that. Uh, I was—I remember being 11 years old on a baseball field, just ha having an epiphany that I have to get the hell out of here. Um, so when I arrived at um, the Pacific Northwest, expecting to find clean air, I live in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I'm in a very big wilderness area, and my home's completely off-grid, and shortly after completing the project, noticing on certain days I was losing 60, 70, even 80 percent of my solar uptake. Those are huge amounts to lose from whatever these aircraft were emitting. So, I mean, clearly something was going on. There would be grid patterns on, on total, uh, in directions that there are no commercial flights, and there would be 10 times more aircraft in the air. So I began my research and quickly found the subject of geoengineering and described exactly what I saw in the sky. I found, I, I located the key elements named in geoengineering patents, aluminum being a primary element, barium being a primary element. I began to test for these elements, and they showed up. First test, seven parts per billion, which was high given the location I'm in. It's, it's considered a filtered forested location. There's, there's trees everywhere. There's no blowing dust ever. Uh, you have no industry, roads, railroads, nothing. A hydrogeologist made it clear to me I should have less than one PPB, not seven. So subsequent rain tests over the next five years escalated as much as 3,450 parts per billion. That's nearly 50,000% increase. It's toxic rain. Things begin to, to die, not sprout. Uh, the intensity of the sun was clearly felt. I spoke to solar water panel manufacturers that said they were seeing degradation of their panels in three years, what used to take 12 years. Um, trees started showing up everywhere with the bark burn off from tip to trunk. Clearly, something was wrong. And, and again, I, I didn't want to believe this was going on either, guys. This is the last battle I ever wanted. I'm not an activist. I'm not politically oriented. But what the hell do you do? When, when, you, when you can't walk out your door without this stuff raining down on you and every breath you take, every breath your child takes is laden with this stuff, what do you do? Yeah, it's, it's like being continually slapped and, and just keep walking. Um, That's right. It, at one point, you got to put your hands up. Um, you, you do. I mean, and this is, again, this is unlike any other issue. The climate engineering issue is unlike any other in that you can't run from it, you can't hide from it, uh, the effects are cataclysmic, and the equation is very, very nonlinear. Uh, Ramon, you mentioned you, you've seen a huge ramp up in the spring since 2009, 2010 in that range. Yeah, in 2000, 2009 is when I learned about it, 2010 okay. is when I moved here. And okay. I would I would rarely see it, but then when I started teaching elementary school, I think that was 2011. Was it time? Do you remember? Yeah, 2011. Um, then there was a huge ramp up, and I remember even pointing it out to the the principal at the school, and I just got you know the same like oh, you don't know what you're talking about kind of look, like oh yeah, that's cute. <laughs> Yeah, they won't be able to stay in that denial much longer. So if you saw it around 2011, 2012, it, 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 we saw a larger ramp up around the globe at that time. We've seen another ramp up in the last few months. So at, in 2010 is when the first observations were reported that they were seeing plumes of methane. This is from a Russian research vessel, plumes of methane from the sea floor in the Laptev Sea a kilometer wide, and they were seeing thousands of these plumes. The sea is literally boiling. Wow. And this is methane hydrate expelling from the sea floor. Now, now let's link this back to climate engineering. The carbon in the atmosphere is a problem. There's no question about that. And I'm not an Al Gore fan or a carbon credits fan or 
any of that. But when we put 100 billion tons, excuse me, we put 100 million tons of carbon in the atmosphere every day, it's about 35 billion tons a year. So that's a problem, but geoengineering is a bigger problem. And geoengineering has altered upper-level wind currents, which has altered ocean currents. Now we have warm water pumping in the Arctic. It's releasing methane. So as, as this methane expulsion is ramped up, and it's, it's picked up momentum since then, it's filling the atmosphere like a layer of glass. So what does the military-industrial complex do? They do what they always do, do more of it. You know, if, if something's causing damage, you're just not doing enough of it. If, if beating your head against the wall hurts, you're just not pounding hard enough. It's, it's just the way they think. And, uh, and there's a lot of other agenda items here, too. I, I can't really deny at this point, with the, given the data we've seen that indicate there's biological testing going on, they're doing a whole lot of things at once. But in relation to the, the heavy ramp-ups, uh, they appear to be trying to preserve the last bit of ice that's left in the Arctic, and it, they're, they've been able to actually increase the extent slightly over a few given years uh, the extent, not the mass, which so the extent is just the surface area, but they've done it at the cost of worsening the, the total global si situation. They can create short-term cooling events over large regions, but it comes at the cost of a worsened overall warming. So the last ramp up you, you've seen in, in recent months, the, the methane is just spewing in the Arctic right now. It's absolutely spewing. And uh, they're, the, they appear to be trying to, to cover that up as long as they can while they're digging in and making provisions to go underground, and that's literally what they're doing. That's an, another good point because um, it's it's really confusing. I always tell Tom how confusing it is because you hear on one side, you hear the global warming and this is uh, and things are getting warmer and, and these ice sheets are melting, but then on the other side, I also hear at the same time that in certain, like for example, in Antarctic, it's in the center, the ice sheets on the outside are, are breaking off and, and coming out, but in the center, they're getting heavier and heavier snow. And also in the Arctic up in the north, the ice sheet actually has grown back. And the same as in, in some mountain regions, like in Peru, where last winter they were getting such heavy um, snow that was actually even killing the cattle. Um, so you hear these conflicting reports of you know, both sides, so it just confuses the crap out of me, and I have no idea, of, you know. Can I jump in on that? Yes, please. I'll try to elaborate. And I understand the confusion, and the confusion has been intentionally created. And in regard to, let me back into this from the front. When the livestock die off, we've seen it in South America, we also have seen it in North America. And there are some very extenuating circumstances around that. Let me give the biggest example where nearly 100,000 cattle died in South Dakota last October. Did you guys hear about that? Right, I did, yeah. So here's what you have. And I posted an article about that specific event. If people want to Google that, Google engineered snowstorms begin again. So we have cattle in South Dakota used to very brutal winters, October 4th, 2013. At the same time that it's 85 degrees and raining in Chicago, it's 89 degrees and raining in Kansas City. And I posted the NOAA maps. They were taken down offline shortly after this event. So you have basically about 90 degrees and raining in surrounding areas. You're 40 degrees and snowing in South Dakota. So how the hell do 100,000 cattle die with 40 degrees and snow in South Dakota? Because it was chemically nucleated. So the ambient temperature doesn't matter. When these when this livestock is encased in snow that's chemically nucleated and that's against their hides, it doesn't matter what the, the ambient outside temperature is. That I'm getting some clicks on this in. I hope you guys can hear me. The ambient temperature against their hide could be 20, 30 below. It causes a freeze flash burn against the animal, kills it. We saw here in Northern California, we had three days below freezing last year. Three, that's it. But on those days, even though it was barely below freezing, we had we lost palm trees that are supposed to be good to low single digits. They're chemically flash burned. I mean, it's astounding the damage that was done. And that's what we would expect from an endothermic reaction. If people want to see what an endothermic reaction is, and this means chemically nucleated snow, if they Google engineered snowstorms, what are they spraying? Look at geoengineeringwatch.org where you can Google that title. I have lab tests in, two, in, one, in that article where people can see what happens when you put 
For example, barium hydroxide and ammonium in a lab beaker drops the temperature about 100 degrees instantly, endothermic reaction. So uh, in the case of biological nucleating agents, another lab test, two minutes long, doesn't take up a lot of time to look at this, a couple drops in a vessel of water freezes it instantly. This is what they're doing. This is, I mean, the snow temperatures now around the globe, you see snow routinely falling at 45 and 50 degrees. How can that be? Because they're chemically nucleating. We can see it on the radar. You'll see big bands of rain flashing out the snow. So back to the ice, Ramon. You, you referred to the headlines last fall that a lot of people saw in September that the Arctic ice had expanded 50%, right? Yes. So how did they get that headline? Because the surface area, which is basically little more than a slush on the surface that they call an ice pack, it had expanded 50% over the previous year, not over the average, not over the normal, over the previous year, 2012, which was an almost total loss of ice. So 50% over not much is still not much. And they did not mention the mass, the volume of the ice, which was at the same time 19% of the 30-year normal. They didn't say a word about that. So that headline was a lie. It was a lie for all practical purposes, complete lie. In fact, the Arctic ice extent right now is at about record low right now. So, and you don't hear much about that. And also, this should be an indicator how the media has changed direction. They're no longer trying to convince us it's warming. Uh, the, the bigger effort is to try to convince us it's not warming. And so when we had, do you guys remember about a month and a half ago when the, the data came out from NASA that said uh, grim news, the headline was grim news from NASA, uh, West, Ar West Antarctic ice sheet collapsing, 15 feet of sea level rise locked in. Do you remember that? Uh, I didn't see that one, actually. No, I didn't see that one either. It's kind of astounding that you wouldn't see that, right? If the media really wanted you, if, if they really were interested in putting this out, you would have seen it. CNN gave it 15 seconds before they went to 10 minutes of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. No kidding. So I'm just saying people have to reset their compass setting and look all the time. In regard to the Antarctic ice, for a moment, which you mentioned as well, yes, there are some areas of sea ice that are growing in Antarctica in a couple, in a couple regions because there's so much fresh water pouring off the mainland, that it's actually desalinating the bays and the freshwater freezes at almost three degrees higher temperature than the seawater. And they're ice nucleating too. So uh, they, they, they pick a, a piece here and there and, and try to put it in the equation. And, and there's a lot of money behind this. There's uh, just with ExxonMobil and the Koch brothers alone, there's about a billion dollars. And this is public record. So here's, here's the deal. Uh, the climate's in meltdown climate engineering is making it far worse, not better. Uh, in fact, we might be in exponentially better shape had they never climate engineered. And that's the point. If the government, if and when they try to have a big news flash that the climate's in meltdown, we need to use geoengineering, my hope is this, that enough people already realize climate engineering is not a cure. It's a curse that has helped to bring us to this point. In addition to toxifying the entire surface of the planet, in addition to shredding the ozone layer, that people don't buy that, that they don't buy no. that as a cure. It, it reminds me of the flu shot, uh, yes. the flu vaccine. You know, it's like um, I remember I kept telling my sister not to vaccinate her daughter, not to, you know, vaccinate her daughter, and she gave her the flu shot, and after that for three, four weeks, she was, you know, worse. And then she was like, you know what, you were right, because, it's, you know, she wasn't sick before, but now she's consistently sick. So it well, seems that the geoengineering is the same kind of idea that's happening on a global scale. It is. It's their mentality. I mean, how many doctors, if, if they're surveyed, the, the percentage of doctors that would not engage in chemotherapy for themselves is huge. So, you know, this is sort of a let's kill the patient to save it, but... There's a lot more going on, though, again, in addition to a, a very destructive, misguided, and, and cataclysmic effort to keep some of the Arctic ice there in order to try to cap some of this methane. There's also weather warfare, no denying that. I mean, what, what happened in Japan, according to Bert Stubblebine, and I, I put a lot of faith in, in um, what he says. He has good Pentagon contacts still, that the, the Fukushima quake was intended and it was 
they felt a number of reasons for that, that that Japan was considering a little closer allying with its regional partners. They were considering backing off from the dollar, and this was a shot across their bow that went wrong. That they did not intend Fukushima uh, or, or to the uh, the meltdown of the nuclear plant, and so also on that Fukushima event, a story I've shared a number of times on air. Three days before the event, I was called by a person on the California coast who has a relative in Army intelligence, and I was asked, had I heard about anything happening in the Pacific? This was on the Tuesday before the quake, which happened on a Friday. I was asked if I'd heard anything, why there would be any reason she should be away from the coast, um, and I didn't. I hear things like that all the time. I was certainly shocked to see the quake on Friday. Now, I know that doesn't prove anything, right. but it was certainly an awakening for me. But, again, we have – I'm reading right now from – this is from – MIT Technology Review. You guys have heard of MIT. Oh, I, no, of course. So we have, uh, it, 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 let me see, uh, M, M9 electron content. I'm trying to show, okay, here we have. At the same time, satellite observations showed a big increase in infrared emissions from above the epicenter. This is straight off the MIT research document, which peaked in the hours before the quake. In other words, the atmosphere was heating up. Okay, this is these uh, kinds of observations are consistent with an idea called lithosphere atmos, atmosphere ionosphere coupling mechanism. The thinking is that in the days before an earthquake, the great stresses in a fault as it about as it is about to give cause the release of large amounts of radon. Now again, they're grabbing at straws while ignoring the elephant in the room of the ionosphere heaters. They're trying to find some reason that this, the atmosphere was heating profoundly above that epicenter while being completely blind to, to the real reason. In fact, a study just released four days ago by the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. You guys remember I described how the geoengineering changes upper-level wind currents, which changes ocean currents and pushes warm water into the Arctic. You have the frontline methane research scientists talking about huge pollution clouds over Canada and the U.S. that are causing these changes in wind patterns and ocean patterns without ever acknowledging what are those pollution clouds right. they're sprayed geoengineering particulates so it's it's quite astounding the sort of uh, willful blindness we have from the academia uh, academic communities right now one uh, one yeah. other little thing about just before the fukushima quake uh, i believe it was toyota that had uh, had announced the release of a hydrogen powered car going into mass production and right after that quake this car disappeared also all of which was this was a water it was a, one of the water uh, uh, conversion vehicles uh, you know we can only guess at what kind of technology has been suppressed and, and that could have been a part of the equation as well and if we look at other instances of weather warfare. We look at the cycle, uh, cyclone Haiyan that cut a swath through the Philippines. We had, uh, again, very anomalous intensification of that storm right before it hit. We had the U.S. move in immediately under humanitarian pretexts. They're setting up bases there now. Uh, now we see Japan is going to decide to re-enter the uh, arms race. They're going to open up. Apparently, Ramon, I mean, you're, are you hearing dialogue of that there as well, right? Yeah, the, the um, between the whole TTP thing and the reconstruction of the Constitution, which um, this Prime Minister is really pushing for all those things, and um, the um, one guy in the Japanese military was telling me that he says there's two things we'll never give up in Japan, and that's the um, this, the um, space program and the nuclear reactors because when you keep those separate it's great but when we need them we can put them together and get guess what you get so yeah. if you notice the um space programs like in America and Japan are really not really doing much yeah they put a couple satellites here and there up in space but not compared to the old days so you know, you start to wonder, is the improvement of the rockets more for for other things than, than what they tell us? For military aggression. I mean, yeah, what yeah. is NASA? NASA's nothing more than a defense contractor. That's all they are. Right. 
And I, you know, it's about time people wake up to that fact. And I, I think a lot of them are. I mean, I, 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 we always believed that all the military pilots have to know that the spraying is going on. I mean, how could they not know? But I had confirmation about a week and a half ago with a government employee friend who's connected with an Air Force colonel that was told this to his face. You know, they all know. So I, I don't know at what point in time perhaps um, their sense of honor kicks in when they realize the ship is going down. And, and right now, to elaborate a little bit too, Ramon on, and Tom on how fast things are unraveling, we're seeing some areas of the Arctic with temperatures 40 degrees above normal, 20 degrees C. Wow. I mean, that's, that's astounding. We had temperatures this last year in the lower 48 that were colder than the North Pole. Now we have, thankfully, uh, about a day old, we have a headline out of uh, the U.K. register. Here's the headline. Brit, uh, both, and okay, Obama's science advisor, this is from a British scientist, and, a, and he's, he's making a statement to Obama's science advisor, which is John Holden. You are wrong on climate change. Cold winters to be more frequent? No. Silly. That's, okay, that's, the bottom line is this. We have Obama's science advisor trying to convince the American public, and they just put out a YouTube out of the White House with John Holdren, trying to convince the American public that these super cold winters are normal. We should expect this with global warming. This is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. This it is. is completely engineered. So why are they saying this? Because they want people to think, oh, okay, this is normal. They said it would happen. It's happening. But now, thankfully, some people in academia are pushing back, saying, no, you don't get cooling with warming. You get warming with warming. And and so I, I think there's some pushback starting to happen, thankfully, because we have climate scientists, and I, I use the term loosely because I, I don't – I don't know what the, the scientific community is for. Nothing they say is is accurate because they don't have the courage to speak to the truth. So, right. But you now have some of them starting to scratch their heads at why the jet stream, how it can possibly do what it's doing, how it can snow at 50 degrees, how this high pressure can be parked over California forever. They're starting to ask questions. Thank you. Right, right. Well, uh, it's a go ahead, Ramon. So, oh, we got a few more minutes, but I want to bring something up. Um, maybe I'll start it now and then you can answer it in the second hour. But there's two different types of, of chemtrails I'm seeing. And one is, you know, the plane passes by, lets out the trail, and you see it perfectly. The other one that I think they're starting to use more, at least here, is the plane passes by and maybe... Mm, I, I can't really tell the difference, but if as wide as, you know, if you pick up your hands and, and you know, from ear to ear and then extend it a couple inches out, maybe that wide up in the sky, so that's several miles, when the plane flies, there's nothing, and then you see the, the trail start to form later. So what I'm seeing now, it's it's not forming right away like before. It's forming um, later, like 30 seconds later, 40 seconds later, when the plane is way far from it. Have you seen that? Yes. We're seeing a lot more of that, just like you are. Okay. So is it uh, is this experiment in a state of flux? They're, they're trying to find ways to be a little less in your face and a mm -hmm. little less visible, perhaps. see a lot of that here, or you'll see... You know, again, a lot of the short, bright trails that seem to dissipate, but the sky becomes much more silvery white. If you block the sun, you mm -hmm. can really see the haze. And we'll also see the cobweb clouds start to form, those hazy, wispy, right. uh, cobwebby-looking things. Uh, people have forgotten. They have forgotten that the sky is blue and clouds are white. Right. Not this, this horrible mix of industrial-looking. looks like a mix between a forest fire and... And some some wispy cobwebs, and it's it's just absolute uh, toxic mess in the sky. But they're yeah. too busy on their iPads. They're too busy wondering when the next football game is going to start. So uh, before we wrap this first hour up, Dane, uh, what can the average person do? What can they do out there to uh, uh, you know if they're concerned about this and they want to you know put their or chime in in some way? What can they do? Again, learn a little bit about it. You don't have to be an expert, but learn a little bit so you have a clue. Next, pass on credible data. Don't just point and rant. Get credible data to pass on. Hold film viewings. Get a copy of Look Up, 
from the skyderalert.com website. That's not my site. I have nothing to do with it, but I appreciate George Barnes and what he's done. That's a good feeling for an intro. Also, the PowerPoints I've done on geoengineering watches is a mouthful for people with hard data. If you can, you can show those. So start spot, start spot fires of awareness everywhere you can, because the immediacy of what we face cannot be overstated. We are in, in free fall to another reality right now. Hmm. Wow. Okay, guys. Uh, Geoengineeringwatch.org is where you can find Dane's website, and uh, it's just chock full of some really good information on this. And he's got ama- some amazing tools there too. He's got flyers and and the DVDs and audio and video and and just tons and tons of different article and data that you can dig through. So uh, I would urge you to pop on over there. Okay, we'll continue this in hour two. And uh, if you're out there listening to this on uh, YouTube or Vimo or iTunes or wherever you happen to be tuning in at, uh, and you want to check out hour two, pop on over to www.100thmonkeyradio.com and uh, check us out over there. And uh, we'll talk to you guys in the second hour. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. Namaste, my friends. Attention, brothers and sisters. Take a look around. We are killing the future. Killing the future. 